Greetings everyone, I'm Adam Harriton, hanging out here in the woods in western Pennsylvania, and today I'm looking for trees. Tree identification, it's the fundamental nature skill that supports all other skills. If you want to be a better birder, if you want to be a better mushroom hunter, if you want to be a better plant forager, if you want to be a better herper and look for reptiles, if you want to be a more conscious landowner, if you want to be a better hunter, learn your trees. Hey everyone, you're gonna love this interview with Adam Harriton. Not the first time that we featured Adam on the channel and he is back again for a multitude of reasons. Number one, he is one of the most fascinating and thoughtful people that I know. Number two, he has a new course focused on tree identification. And in this interview, we talk all about why understanding trees is so essential to whatever part of nature that you like to study. Adam's own adventures building this course and the enormous amount of dedication that he puts into his craft. Enjoy. The last course that you did was three years ago? Yes, 2019 is when I released it. The mushroom course. But I started course. work on it about a year and a half before that. So this is the last time you dropped a course and each time you spent years on the course, um, that was super successful. Yeah, I guess it depends how you define success. But for me, it was successful. And it still is successful. I didn't trash it or throw it away or delete it. I still market it. I still sell it. But because I'm working on a new course, it's not the main focus uh, of my business right now. But it's still there because I'm, it's still a good product. It still contains good information, relevant information. So if people continuously want that course, they can still purchase it. And I know it's successful because it's one of the only... Uh, things that a, a guest of mine or someone that's kind of entered my content universe was selling that multiple people have come up to me and said, I took that, uh, I took Adam's course and it's fantastic. Like my girlfriend and I go mushroom hunting, however frequently because of what we learned from his course. So like, that's just my like anecdotal data set is that's different than the norm from the people. Oh, I didn't know that people actually came up to you. Yes. Multiple times. That's neat. Um, so this is your second course. Correct. It's the Mushrooms second was the, for the first one. Why trees for the second one? So I could have done a bunch of different things. Maybe the most obvious would have been to make a more intermediate to advanced mushroom course. If you were in this space, you'd understand that would probably be an obvious choice. Maybe not to too many outsiders, but I actually got a lot of requests to do a more intermediate to advanced mushroom course. And I thought about it as well. Instead, I made a major pivot and decided to do trees instead. It's not even like I really had to think too hard about it. It's just where I was being led in that direction. I knew trees to a very large degree. I was interested in learning trees, but I also knew that lots and lots and lots of other people really wanted to know trees, but they never ever made time to learn them. I kept hearing routinely from people in the nature space, I want to know trees, I wish I knew trees. I don't know how to learn trees. I don't know when to learn trees. What's the best way to learn trees? And a lot of people think that if you just spend enough time outside, you're going to learn them. If you just hang outside in the woods, if you just go fishing, if you just go hunting, if you learn mushrooms, if you learn birds, if you learn anything, just through osmosis and just by being out there, eventually you're gonna learn the trees. And to some degree that's true, but it's a very, very, very slow process. A better process, in my opinion, and it's worked for me, is to actually discipline yourself and say, I'm going to learn trees. I'm going to spend this year, maybe next year, maybe the next three years, focusing on trees. A lot of people that I know in the nature space, they go outside and they look for something else besides trees because trees are just always there. And it's almost like because they're so ubiquitous and so commonplace, at least here in Eastern North America, clearly not everywhere. So I just want to provide that disclaimer that we're talking specifically about Eastern North America. Because they're so common, I think people just don't notice them as so, much as they notice a mushroom that only appears for two weeks out of the entire year, and then boom, it's gone for maybe another year or two. Birds, sometimes they just come and go. But with a tree, it's just always there. So it's like, I'll get to it. I'll get to it. Or I'll just hang out here and I'll mention, maybe that's an oak, maybe it's a maple, I'm not quite sure. But if you discipline yourself and you follow a prescribed program, you can learn this stuff way faster. And it's kind of like an inversion of the saying you missed the forest through the trees. Yes. It's a lot of people miss the trees through the forest. Yeah, exactly. And 
it's, that's been my case with me as well in my nature studies as well. They were just so common that I didn't think I actually needed to sit down and learn them, but I did. So uh, it's been rewarding. So what's the hook? Because if someone is, you know, dipping their toe into learning mushrooms, they have maybe heard of the medicinal properties or it's this almost like distinct, um, you have the right term for me here, but, but family of organisms that they're just completely new to. Because, oh, I've heard of plants, animals, this, that, the insects, this, that, the other thing. But this, is, you know, it's a distinct part of the entire biology to understand. What's the hook with learning trees? They're not going to eat it. They're probably not going to get into, like, woodworking necessarily. Well, eating you can certainly do because a lot of food actually comes from trees. And a lot of wild foods do come from trees. So that's one hook. But even deeper than that, and that wasn't actually why I created the course. It wasn't necessarily for foragers specifically, but tree identification is in tree landscapes. I'm specifically talking about in areas where trees grow. It's the fundamental nature skill that supports all other skills. If you want to be a better birder, if you want to be a better mushroom hunter, if you want to be a better plant forager, if you want to be a better herper and look for reptiles, if you want to be a more conscious landowner, if you want to be a better hunter, learn your trees. And so I came up with this saying, and it's, it needs a lot of explanation. So it, I'm not so quick to just like put this quote out there because a lot of people would find fault with it. But if you want to learn mushrooms, learn mushrooms. If you want to learn birds, learn birds. If you want to learn reptiles, learn reptiles. If you want to learn everything, learn trees because trees support all of that. And I kind of did it backwards with mushrooms. I started learning mushrooms, but whenever you learn mushrooms, you realize that you become such a better mushroom forager and hunter and identifier of mushrooms when you learn your trees because they form intimate associations. So that's kind of how I got into trees that way, but I realized, oh, if I just did it the other way, if I actually learned my trees first, I would be a way better mushroom hunter. And your overall nature literacy improves with tree identification in my experience, it's more so than when you learn all of those other things. Edible plants, just fungi, just birds. It's trees. Let's take it one step down to the, for the simpletons like me. Can you give us a tangible example? So you're talking about like these intimate associations between a, a specific mushroom and a specific tree. Um, it's helping you find the, the reptile you might be looking for, find the bird you might be looking for. Can you give us a tangible example? So when I'm... When I see this, here's the hierarchy of insights, or maybe not insights, but uh, likelihoods, probabilities that are going to be somewhere adjacent to it. So right now, the number one mushroom that's on everybody's mind in Eastern North America is the morel mushroom. Have you heard of the morel? I have. Have you tasted a morel? I have. Have you looked for morels? I have not. Do you like morels? I do. Do you like the taste of it? So it's a very tasty mushroom. It's a somewhat elusive mushroom as well. Very short season. It's here in Western Pennsylvania, I'd say late March through about early May, and then you're done. You could find it in the grocery store, but dried, it's probably a couple hundred dollars per pound. Wow. Very difficult to cultivate. Now, some people are working on cultivating these mushrooms, but if you, just generally speaking, if you find expensive mushrooms in a grocery store, it's probably because they're wild foraged and they're very difficult to cultivate. And one of the reasons is because they form these unique associations with trees. And if you don't have those associations, it's very difficult to cultivate and propagate them. One of the number one tips for finding this mushroom that even people who aren't that interested in trees will tell you, learn your trees. There's only a select handful of trees here in Western Pennsylvania where morels tend to grow in many, many cases. It's elm trees, it's ash trees, it's tulip poplar trees. Apple trees, they say apple trees? Apple trees, and there's a couple more. Rather than just walking around the woods anywhere, like just going to a park hoping that you're going to find morels, that can happen. It happens all the time with people. But if you want to find like the honey hole of morel mushrooms, get into one of those areas where those trees grow. And you dramatically increase the chances that you're going to find those mushrooms. And then when you take a step back and you think, wait a minute, so if morels grow in association with these trees, well, why do they grow in association with those trees in particular? There's a couple more trees that they grow in association with, generally speaking. I know there's a lot more, but cottonwoods, um, box elders, perhaps, 
uh, and some other trees that typically grow in fertile areas with higher pH soils. And so even if you don't know that about the trees, if you make that association that these mushrooms grow in association with soils that are fertile and higher pH, you could just go to those specific areas. But you wouldn't really know that just by learning the mushrooms. Mushrooms don't tell you that much about those soil conditions and fertility. It's the association with those trees that give away those ecological clues. If we were to also take the step back to not even shows like this, but folks that are very online and very much thinking about business, there's this whole thing, sell an online course, build once, sell forever. We've literally just had another guest, Eric Jorgensen, who's, who's built his own course there. And he worked exceptionally hard to write the almanac of Naval and then build this course about applying more leverage to your life. In your case, knowing, number one, how good you are on camera, you've had stunning success on YouTube, knowing the work rate that you have and your willingness to put in ungodly hours to put content out, and just the fact that you know more about nature than literally anyone else I know. You could have very quickly, if you had wanted to, optimized for monetization and turned right around and resold not only the intermediate course to uh, for mushrooms, but you know a uh, 50, uh, maybe not fifty percent, but a, a, a C plus B minus course on trees. And given the quality of that past course, and given the size of your audience, could have had. Uh, plenty of success. You didn't choose to do that. You chose the longer path for actually producing this course. We don't know how it's going to do yet. We're recording this before the launch has actually happened. I'll go out on a limb and say it's probably going to be pretty successful. Um, talk to me about the actual production process for a single video in the course and then obviously how many videos there are. <laughs> I, I did not understand what a behemoth of a project this would become. And I use that word behemoth now because it's the only thing that comes to mind when I think of this project. I've been working on this for two and a half years. And it's taken everything out of me, everything, the past two and a half years of my life. I've said no to so many things in order to make this course work. I want to make that really legible because like you're, you're in it, so you're like, you know, you're uh, a fish in water, so to speak. When you say that you're working on it for two and a half years, you are not saying on the weekends, on, on this evening, once per week. This is every day. No, it's every day. I mean, I can count on one hand the number of days I've taken off. Okay. I just want to make sure that's... On one hand in two and a half years. I wanted to make sure that was clear to the people listening. And I I'm, know, I'm but I don't I'm not saying think... it to brag about it because, I mean, I love the work. I really do. And it's not, like I'm, it's not like I talk about it publicly. Like if you go on my channel, you have no idea what kind of work I do in this course. A lot of people just see the finished product, which is the way it should be, I think. But I'm glad you kind of give me the opportunity to explain what goes on. It's an important lesson though. Some, like some people will be, be cynical and they'll, they'll hear me ask what seems like a leading question and they will think that it's, oh, I'm like helping Adam position his course so that people will buy it. That is not the point that I'm trying to make here. The point that I'm trying to make is lots and lots of people want special outcomes. And the last course, once again, you're not going to brag on it. It was very successful because you have a very loyal audience, a very big audience that paid for the course. And that was a, a good business outcome for you by most conventional people's definitions. And the opportunity to bring something like that again and to have those types of outcomes, particularly in a field of, uh, uh, you know, being a naturist or being someone who is focused on nature that's not known for, this isn't Wall Street. It's not like there's a bunch of people rolling around in Bugattis, right? So the ability to have that type of opportunity is only the byproduct of a disproportionate amount of hard work. And so to me, that's the thing I just, I want to make sure people hear because I don't know if I would have always heard that when other people would have told a similar story. And it's that, that's what I was really hoping to, to make sure people take away, but keep going with what actually goes into the production of one of these videos. So the bulk of the course is tree identification. There are videos on tree ecology, on physiology, on taxonomy, on anatomy, and all these different other functions of trees and features of trees, but the bulk of it is tree identification. So to produce one of those tree identification videos, because those are the bigger videos in the course, I mean, 50 to 100 hours per video, maybe. Some a lot more, some maybe less. 
but it's a lot of research in advance. It's a lot of fleshing out my thoughts and learning a lot of things that I didn't know about these trees. I mean, identification is one thing, but knowing which parts of a tree to teach somebody, the key features, the differences between closely related species. I mean, some things you really don't need to talk about. So I had to, you know, be very careful about what I want to include so I don't turn every video into like a four hour lesson on one tree because there's over 100 trees in this course. So lots of research, a lot, a lot of uh, not really scripting as far as like writing word for word exactly what I'm going to be saying on the camera, but some of those thoughts I actually put down on paper. So when I'm running B-roll, I can go over certain features that I need to make sure are in the video. But scouting, it was a huge part of it. I mean, for some of these trees, not only do I need to know where they grow, but I need to make sure it's not just growing on like a main road where just cars are going to be flying by. That would be too easy to try to film something there, but the quality would be absolutely horrible. Even in a big park, like if I would go to, like we're familiar with North Park or Shenley Park, lots of great trees in those areas, but I don't feel comfortable setting up my camera on a main trail and filming it. It would take maybe two or three hours just to film a particular tree with a lot of people going by and car noises and sirens and all these different things. So finding the perfect tree to film in front of. But some of these trees took me weeks to even find in the wild. And so I don't even account that into like the 50 to 100 hours of work. Yeah. But after you film the video, then you have to back up and back up and back up and put your backups in these fire safe boxes and make sure that nothing's going to happen to them. But then the editing process, I spent, I'm still working on the editing process, but after I filmed all the videos, I said, okay, January of 2022, I'm going to start editing. I'm going to do one tree a day. And I probably worked 10 to 12 hours a day for two and a half months straight, like not a single day off. And I just made sure I was going to do it. You know, I made sure I was nourished. I made sure I had enough sleep. I said no to pretty much everything else that wasn't important in life. And I just went at it. And so by the time mid-March rolled around, I could finally take a breath and catch up on some things that I needed to film. Then exporting, and exporting takes another couple of hours. So a lot of work goes into each single video, but whenever you watch a video and it's half an hour long, it doesn't look like it took that much work. And that's the whole point. I don't want people to know any of that stuff because I don't want it to look like I labored really hard to make this stuff happen. It's the hard work to make it look effortless. Yeah, uh-huh. And I, I want to just make sure people catch another detail there. This, none of this B-roll is sourced from some library. None of this is borrowed from someone else's footage. Every single tree you went, you found, you identified, which hopefully you're obviously able to do if, if you're teaching a course like this, and you shot the footage yourself. In every season. So it wasn't like, okay, I found the tamarack tree, which is not a common tree in Pennsylvania, You'll find it in central Pennsylvania. You'll find it in remote bogs. Three and a half hours drive to find it. Okay, go visit it in every season and capture every feature. And the difficulty in doing this is some of the features are only available for maybe two or three weeks. And if you don't time it perfectly, you miss it. And that's why I gave myself two years and not one year. Originally, I gave myself one year to do this course. And I said, I'll just pump it out in one year and the next year I'll release it. And that's what I did with the mushroom course. But it became too difficult to do that because I was missing things. I mean, you're trying to capture 100 trees in four seasons. You're inevitably going to miss things in one year. I miss things in two years that I'm still trying to capture right now before I release the course in a couple weeks. So how many, how many videos, how many trees are there in the course? It's about 108 or 9 trees. And how do you keep that organized? Because, I, I, once again, I don't know any of the stuff. One iota as well as you do, but... We have, uh, I'm just thinking permutation wise, I'm just going to call it 108 trees, four seasons, multiple permutations of the elements that need to be captured in order to be identified. So you have to be maniacal just about organizing all that so that you can go back and find the piece that you need when you're actually in post-production. Mm -hmm. How does that work? A lot of it's just in my mind. I remember where I saw things. I remember when I saw things. Not maybe exact dates, but I know maybe the exact week. And so when I go into folders and I just look at the dates, I know exactly where I can find things. 
clearly I have folders labeled for each tree and I dump all the footage in there. But when I am editing the final video and I have to compile hours and hours of footage into a 30 minute video, I have to be very picky and I have to be fast about pulling this stuff out. But a lot of it's just memory. Like when I go out into these areas, because I don't use GPS, because I don't use a lot of technology out there, I just rely on my instincts and I rely on my observations. And I talk about this a lot in the course, that's key to learning trees or learning anything. It's your observations in real time. It's not through technology, even though I'm filming and I understand that. But when I'm filming, clearly I'm also looking around with my own eyes. And so a lot of the organization is just using my brain and using my memory to figure out where things are on my computer. What is the best way to use a course like this? So what, what, what you know, back in the analog days, you would have a guide, like a guide book, and you'd be walking out in the woods with this book, pulling it open and, you know, looking for the picture that was probably on there along with the text describing what one might see. You're selling a course, you rock, walk around with a flip phone. People certainly aren't bringing laptops out there, but maybe they bring a smartphone. Are you imagining this is something where you, you watch it the night before you go out, you have it with you as you're out and about doing tree identification? Like what's, what's as you're kind of putting yourself in the shoes of the student trying to become a better tree identifier, how do you imagine that arc going? So there are quite a few videos in the course that teach you how to learn trees. The process of just, when you find a tree, what do you do? Where do you even start with this? And so there are no assignments as far as like, you get graded on this thing and then I check it and I make sure that you did a good job. I never liked that stuff in school. I'm not so sure that's effective anyway. So I didn't put any of that stuff in there. It's basically up to the student to decide how they're going to make the best use of a course like this. But first, it's absolutely essential that a student learns how to identify a tree. And so I have a couple videos on that. For summer season, when things are actually active and growing and nice and green and there's fruits and flowers, which is a lot easier. And then the difficult time, which is the winter season, how to do that. If you can master that, you could basically identify any tree that you ever come across. This course is not meant to be a standalone one form of media that you absorb and then you can use this and that's it. I also recommend using it in conjunction with a guide. I also recommend using it in conjunction with a live person, a local expert, a nature club. I also recommend going on local events and attending events, whether this is through a, uh, like an environmental center or a state park, arboretums host events like this. This is how you actually learn the trees. In this course, after you watch a video, my recommendation for everybody is, let's say you just watch the oak videos. Before you even go through this course, it's important that somebody understands which trees grow in their state. And so that's like the first thing I have people do is find a list of trees that grow in your state. It doesn't matter where you live. These lists are very easy to acquire. You could look online, you could look in a book, uh, you can call up a nature center and they'll tell you, here are the trees that grow in your state. Whenever you watch a video on oaks or maples or ashes, figure out which of those trees grow in your state and then go find them. And then you go identify them yourself with the information that I provided in this course. Not all these trees in this course are going to grow where people live, but a good majority will because I'm marketing towards a certain section of people who live in a certain part of Eastern North America. So I don't imagine people from Italy or Europe or Africa purchasing this course and finding much benefit in it. How so broadly trees, applicable is it though? Like, like, like in terms of the range of where these trees would be seen versus not seen? Is it just exclusive? Like, what, like is it the Great Plains that's the cutoff or how would one think about that? So the most broadly speaking would be Eastern North America. If you're in Western North America, you're probably not going to find much benefit in this course. Your odds of really deriving the most benefit are greatly enhanced once you move east of the Rocky Mountains. More specifically, it's the Great Lakes regions, the Mid-Atlantic, the Northeast, and the North and Central Appalachian regions. People who live in these areas, they'll know if that fits like their criteria. With the mushroom course, they, you know, a lot of people did buy it that don't live anywhere near Eastern North America, and they derive benefit in it because a lot of these trees, the genus at least, like the genus of oaks or the genus of maples, they don't just grow here, they grow everywhere. And if you learn the features of the genus of trees, which I do cover with each group of trees, you can learn these trees much faster. And so rather than just teaching you, these are the specific oaks, which I do, 
before we even get into that, we discuss what makes an oak tree an oak tree. Why is an oak tree different than a maple tree? Why is it different than an ash tree? And why is all this important to begin with? And so it really equips you with the knowledge of how to learn this stuff rather than here's the answer, this is all you need. Because with field guides and with apps, especially the apps these days where you just take a picture and it tells you what it is, that can help, but it bypasses serious key steps in the learning process and it does not teach you how to identify a tree. This course actually teaches you how to identify a tree. And then after we discuss a certain tree, it's up to you to go out and then find the trees of that group that grow where you live. So one of the things that, and, and I'm trying to do some pattern matching here so you can bat this way if you think it's baloney, but um, uh, one of my projects when, uh, during like 2020 when everything was shut down, was I challenged myself to learn all of the countries on the globe. And the reason for that was I was hearing these different like bits of history and maybe like, you know, something like the Peloponnesian War, which there literally is no Peloponnesia in modern times. And I just couldn't, I couldn't put it on anything in my brain to retain it because I didn't have the actual terrain. But once you start understanding that Turkey and the Ottoman Empire and all these other things are basically the same place and you know exactly where that is on the map and you know where that is in relation to the Black Sea and the Med and Greece and these other things, you can start to actually picture it and like store it, at least for me personally, in my brain in terms of understanding what the, where these different events may be taking place relative to one another. And what it really sounds like is that in conjunction with these other resources that you've said, finding the local mentors, the nature clubs, the field guides, a tree specific course is going to be that type of solution for someone who is trying to actually commune with nature, not just walk down the street of the city. And isn't it nice that they planted this one tree surrounded by sidewalks, surrounded by houses, surrounded by roads, and actually go out into nature and nature's do you know, where nature is significantly less encumbered and make sense of what it is that they're seeing and being around. Yeah, I mean, it, it's the beginning of forming intimate connections with non-human organisms. And trees are a great place to start if people haven't started. I mean, there's other ways to do it as well, but it goes back to what we said a couple minutes ago. When you learn trees, the other things kind of fall into place, and learning that becomes much easier. You know, I studied music for a long time, and I used to play many different instruments, but I started on piano. I had no idea that piano playing was literally like tree identification, where if you learn piano, your ability to learn other instruments is dramatically improved, rather than if you just learn the flute to begin with, if you just learn the clarinet, if you just learn the guitar. And I'm not exactly sure what it is about the piano. Maybe it's the two hands. I don't know what it is, but there's just something about piano. It's a very difficult instrument to master. That if you start with that, it's like the other things just become easier. I'm not saying you're easily going to master every other instrument, but your ability to pick up something and to learn it much more quickly is just enhanced. And I just made that connection recently with the trees. You know, if you learn the trees, it's like learning the piano. So that when you pick up birds or you pick up mushrooms, or you pick up edible plants, it just becomes so much easier. Well, uh, I want to share digital coordinates where people can learn more. We're going to get a little bit more into the Adam Harriton uh, trajectory here in, in part two, but uh, for folks that want to learn more about the course, see all the things uh, that you're up to generally, what digital coordinates can we point people towards? Uh, learnyourland.com. I have a YouTube channel, it's Learn Your Land. Uh, the course is called Trees in All Seasons, so folks can go to treesinallseasons.com. Learnyourland.com will take you everywhere. We're going to link that in the show notes for this episode, and uh, like I said, go into a part two here with Adam real quick. Uh, but before we jump to part two, can we give you the mic to issue an actionable personal challenge to the audience? Yes, of course it's going to be about trees. But rather than keep it super broad, learn trees or learn five trees. Find a tree that's growing closest to your home. And if you cannot identify it, learn to identify it. Do all that you can to identify that tree that's growing closest to where you live. Now, you might live right in the middle of the city where there's not a tree that's right outside of your house, but I'm sure it's not going to take you that long, if you live in eastern North America, to find that tree that's growing closest to your home. And chances are that that tree is actually going to be probably the easiest one to learn if it's growing closest to home, because there's domestication, there's urbanization there, 
it's going to be a fairly common tree. It's probably not going to be that tamarack that's out in the bog somewhere. Unless you live in the middle of a bog. That's a different story. Right on. Uh, Adam's going to tell us the story of heading out into the bog in part two. Check that out. Hit subscribe and uh, stay tuned right here. Adam, thanks for being here for part one. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Thanks for watching the end of part one of my interview with Adam. If you haven't checked out part two yet, we're linking it right here. We get into Adam's philosophy about his work. We cover a story about when he almost got lost in order to get a little bit of footage for the course and some other interesting tidbits. Check it out.